today's book review, The Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols. Let's dig in. So with this one, let's start out with a quote. Uh, at page one in The Death of Expertise, you can find footnotes in the written version of this uh, for like what page you find everything. It's not page one. I don't know what page it is because I'm looking at the footnote. Anyway, first footnote. Um, These are dangerous times. Never have so many people had so much access to knowledge yet have been so resistant to learning anything. So that's how Tom Nichols uh, starts off the death of expertise, <laughs> basically saying, you're great, we got a lot of knowledge, but you're doing nothing with it. So what's the point, really? If you're not going to do anything with it, then why? Why is this knowledge around? Now, one of the first points that he makes in the book is that much of society today is not okay with any type of disagreement. That if you don't take my opinion as totally valid, even if it's like demonstrably false, so like me telling my kids that the thing, the green box outside our house is called a transformer, and it turns into a robot. Like, that's demonstrably false. It doesn't actually happen. But because I say it's my opinion, you have to just take it as valid. And you have to value it as much as any other, you know, real opinion. This does electricity stuff. Uh, he faults that as like, I mean, basically says it's stupid. <laughs> Which I would I would agree with, that all opinions are not created equal. He actually tells a great story. Um, I'm going to get mixed the details up a little bit. But where a professor, like, say, really well known on um, nuclear arms, we'll say. Uh, we're missing some of the details here. But really well known on nuclear arms, and he has a disagreement with the student. The student finally says, oh, we just have to agree to disagree. Or, you know, something like both opinions are valid. And the professor says, no, 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 no. After 25 years, my opinion is much more valid. And so that's one of the things that he talks about that uh, later in the book, that yes, experts can be wrong. But at the same time, they are more likely to be right in their narrow field of expertise. Remember this, in their field of expertise, not in anything else. Uh, and that's one of the things he faults uh, experts on, right? You become, um, he actually faults actors a lot on this. You become an expert actor and then you start goop, say. And uh, you talk about, does he actually talk about this and this? Like putting like, I don't know, mugwood steam vagina baths, like, because it's going to help and and. And he actually has like an expert come in and say, uh, say no, like if you're having so much pressure that it gets like uh, right up inside and like cleanses everything inside, then you're basically going to explode your uterus. This is a terrible thing. It's never going to happen. So that's interesting. And, and like, even he cites others, not just scientists. That's the one, or not just actors. That's the one I remember. Um, so Gwyneth Paltrow does goop. So Gwyneth Paltrow is an expert on acting, and that's where she should let it stop. Uh, he cites other people who are like pushed vitamin C, and there's like not really truth as much to that. It's a placebo. And there's actually more vitamin C. What did I read this in? There's more vitamin C in a pepper. Um, you can check that fact, but I believe there's more vitamin C in like a green pepper than, or red pepper, orange pepper, one of the peppers than uh, there is in uh, oranges. But some famous scientists that won like the Nobel Prize decided that oranges were the best. And so that's what they went with. Now, the second part of this issue with knowledge is the Dunning-Kruger effect. And basically that means the less we know, the more sure we are we know something. Um, and with internet searches, uh, it was an interesting thing. If you just search about something, you don't have to like really read much. If you just search about something, you'll say, oh, I'm way better informed because I searched for it, which, you know, seems faulty to me. I hope it seems faulty to you too. You don't even have to read it, um, but you do, yeah. And then he also talks about like polarizing, how the internet polarizes. So Google does this in your search engines where it continues to point you towards resources for your search that it thinks you will most uh, affiliate with, which is good except for the fact that it also means you're never going to see the alternate point of view. Well, that's another point he makes in Death of Expertise. Um, he doesn't say it in these words, but this is how I've always thought of it, that if you don't understand the alternate point of view well enough to argue it, then you don't understand it. And your, your view doesn't stand out much. So that's actually one of the reasons I'm reading. Uh, you can see it over here. Yeah, Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion, uh, and um, I'm a Christian, and Mere Christianity. Because if I don't understand the opposite view, then do I really understand my own view? That's another thing that he points out and that people are just unwilling to do this because that's way too much work. Well, one of the things that Nichols hits on is higher education and that the customer is always right. Um, that's the student in this case. And so students make a choice on their education more often on the dorms now than the academics uh, and that they, um, yeah, they want to save space and that they literally say to teachers that know your job is not to educate me, it's to create a safe space for me. It actually goes with iGen really, uh, really good as well. And whereas iGen says, so he, he takes this in a bad view. Uh, yeah, here's a quote here, right? When feelings matter more than rationality or facts, education is a doomed enterprise. Emotion is an unassailable defense against expertise with a moat of anger and resentment in which reason and, and knowledge quickly drown. 
And so he's talking about you know, all the safe space stuff and that it's coddling the American mind. There's a, I think there's a book by that title, which I have on my list to read at some point. Um, and iGen goes with that too. Now iGen, he, he views it as a really negative thing. Like this is just terrible. How can college students do this? And they're just basically, you know, much, you know, much less mature than they were before. And iGen agrees with that. iGen says, absolutely they are. But what we've done is we basically pushed um, everything back a little bit. So we pushed uh, all the development back. So like your 18 year old is more like a 16 or 15 year old, right? Today, a 20 year old is more like a 17 year old. Um, a 22 year old is more like a 19 year old. Um, so that was, that's interesting. That's an interesting point uh, around development of people, uh, of us, of the generations coming next. And part of that is in iGen, at least it's because we have, again, kept them so safe and kept them monitored by parents so much that they just don't have time to develop the skills like they did before. Um, we even watched uh, Grease, the movie recently, and my wife and I were both laughing like, Number one, there's no way these are teenagers. And number two, like the things that in theory teenagers did there, like that doesn't happen. I know even when I grew up, like I, I got caught having a beer by the cops at 16 and the cops said in the park and the cops said, give me the beer, go home. That was the end of it. Um, whereas now that doesn't seem to happen. There's a lot more like, where are the parents? And this is also terrible when kids are safer by far, like not even close to, <laughs> not even close to how unsafe they've been in the past. And yet we continue to coddle and coddle and coddle and not let them do anything and then not let them develop the adult skills. So he takes us as a college professor saying like, this is terrible. Like you're, if you're never going to encounter an idea that is contrary to what you think, then you're basically building a brittle personality. That's going to be in uh, the words of Neil Pashricha and you are awesome. A porcelain doll. Um, I've done a text review of that before. So I will link that somewhere around here so that you can read that. If you want the review of you are awesome by Neil Pashricha, which they sent, he sent me um, or the, the publisher sent me. Um, but I yeah, reviewed and recommended that before. Um, so yeah. And Nicole says, you know, there's no safe spaces in the world, really. Like you're going to try to get them in college and you're not really going to encounter them again. So you're just delaying any growth, uh, in your own uh, skin to be able to handle these things. And one of the final things he addresses is how journalism has changed uh, and how it is now more 24 hour news cycle, how they need so much time filled that you don't even have to be that much of an expert to get on the news. Cause you just have to have an opinion and they'll take it as valid, you know, see the other thing. It actually made me think of uh, John Oliver next week today or something like that, where they do like, here's a climate argument and they have like one-on-one -on -one, and he says, so he says this, a one-on-one -on -one argument often disguises the scientific uh, community's actual opinion on it. So in the John Oliver one, which is linked in the show notes, he says, um, we're gonna have like a real argument here and it's one-on-one. -on -one. He's like, no, 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 no. We're going to have a real argument, like a statistically representative argument. And they have three climate deniers and they have 97 climate people that say, yes, this really happens. Uh, and it's true because that's kind of how it goes. 97% of scientists say that climate change is real and that we need to be worried about it. And 3% say, nope. And so a one-on-one -on -one argument makes it look like a 50-50 proposition when it is anything but. So another thing that he says that news does, and they're looking for entertainment, they're looking for eyeballs, they're looking for attention. They're not looking for anything else. And that has also devalued the news that we get. No longer are we getting news that we need to have, that they think we need to know, even if it's hard. We are being continually asked what we want to know, and they are feeding us the things we want to know that reinforce their own beliefs instead. And now finally, uh, Nichols really, at the end, addresses when experts are wrong. Because experts are wrong. We love to idolize the, uh, you know, expert is wrong thing, like this happens all the time, but the truth is they're almost always right. Um, and yeah. So the times they are wrong is when they start getting out to their field, right? That's the, uh, the scientist I talked about that said vitamin C was amazing when it, it is okay for you, but it's not like this all thing that like cures everything. Um, or was it the guy who made Vaseline, like ate Vaseline, like he's great at some things, not at that. Um, and then the other thing to remember that experts are not great at incorporating information from outside their jurisdiction. Uh, and also they're not great at predicting. Experts are bad at predicting. And part of that is the function is that science uh, Nichols claims is supposed to tell us what happened, maybe why it happened, but not predict anything. And we have really reversed that science is supposed to tell us what's going to happen with something in the future. And that's just not its job. Um, so yeah, there's a good, good long caution for experts at the end. And we'll actually, uh, here's a quote out of that too. One of the most common expert errors. We'll start that again. One of the most common errors experts make is to assume that because they are smarter than most people about certain things, they are smarter about everything. And they're not. Um, now he doesn't really put the whole burden on experts though to check themselves. He puts the burden on the populace, on people, on us to understand what makes an expert. Are they talking in their field of view? 
And how do I know that their credentials are actually backed up, right? Is it like Bob's College of Bobness that gave them a degree or is it I don't know, MIT, something like that? And that is up to us as people, as participants in a country, or he's talking in the US, but it's in a democracy, to be informed so that we can judge the experts and hold them accountable when we need to. The final thing is, should you read uh, The Death of Expertise by Tom Nichols? And, and at first glance, it can certainly come off as, I'm an academic and I'm whining that academics aren't as popular as they once were. Um, and that's an easy read to get if you wanted it. it uh, but I don't think that tells the whole story. There might be some of that in there. I think, you, you know, you could probably knock off a couple percentage and say, yeah, okay, this part of the book is just an academic being a little whiny that things have changed. Specifically, maybe uh, we're kind of related to iGen and he said, like, you're all porcelain dolls and this is terrible. And iGen says, well, okay, it's not great. Or it's, it's different. They, iGen takes a sense that it's different. It's not good or bad. It's just different. And that this delayed development, this development is delaying a little bit. So we need to help the generations along. So if we were to balance that point in the education, I think everything else holds up really well. Even the consumerism of education. And I think that um, if you're interested in how to to check your own beliefs, to look at what you can do better um, to be more informed citizen and how you can understand the value that experts can bring, uh, where to trust them and where not to, then yes, The Death of Expertise is a good book to read. Have a good one. If you like the book, you can, if you like the video, if you like the video, you can give me a thumbs up below. You can subscribe. Don't hit the stupid bell. You should go read, do something else, watch, schedule video time. Watch me then. Uh, other than that, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash If you want more reading, more book reviews, more stuff like that. Have a good one.